ancient Egypt, a civilization renowned for its grandeur and mystique. Today we delve into the lesser known, darker chapters that textbooks often leave behind. From the sinister plots within royal palaces to harrowing plagues that struck the Nile Valley, these are the stories of turmoil, intrigue, and adversity that ancient Egypt endured. Starting off today, we have the Harem Conspiracy. Imagine the palace of Pharaoh Ramesses III, a place where many people lived, including his family and servants. Within this grand palace, a secret and dangerous plan was being made. One of the pharaoh's own wives, along with some other people in the palace, didn't want him to be pharaoh anymore. They wanted to replace him with Pentuer, her son, which would make him the new ruler of Egypt. This secret plan, however, did not stay secret for very long. It was discovered before they could harm the pharaoh. Ramesses III ordered an investigation and they found out who was involved in this plot. These people were then put on trial, which was big and a serious event because it involved members of the royal family. In the end, the people who were found guilty faced severe punishments. Some were even forced to take their own lives, which was a way for them to maintain some honor despite their betrayal. This whole event showed that even within the walls of a grand and powerful palace, there could be dangerous secrets and plots highlighting the intense personal and political rivalries of the time. Next up today, we are talking about the plague of 430 BC. In the year 430 BC, Egypt was not ruled by Egyptians, but by Persians who had a vast empire. During this time, a terrible plague occurred. This particular plague was so severe that it was recorded by a famous Greek historian named Herodotus, who wrote about the events he learned or heard from others during his travels. Herodotus noted that this plague had a devastating effect on the people living in Egypt. Many people got very sick, a lot of them died, and this wasn't just a tragedy for the families who lost their loved ones. Ones, it also created big problems for the entire country. When lots of people are sick or dying, there are of course a few issues. Firstly, work stops. Farms, shops, and other businesses can't operate normally. This means less food and goods are produced, which can lead to shortages and make life harder for everyone. With less work being done and more people in need of care, the economy, the way money and resources flow through the country, can get really bad. People might not have enough money or food, which can cause even more suffering. When people are unhappy or struggling, they then lose their trust in leaders, and this can lead to changes to who is in charge, sometimes through peaceful means and other times through conflict. So the plague in 430 BC wasn't just a health crisis, it also affected jobs, food availability, and who was in control, making it a very tough time for the people living in Egypt. Next up on our list today, we are going quite a bit darker, and we have the massacre at Thebes. This event is a very dark chapter in ancient Egyptian history when their city, Thebes, which was a hub of culture and power, faced an absolutely brutal attack. The Assyrian king, Ashurbanipal led this assault. He was the ruler of a vast empire that covered much of the Middle East at the time, and he turned his sights on Egypt, seeking to control its wealth and very strategic location. When Ashurbanipal's forces invaded Thebes, they caused tremendous destruction. They didn't just fight the soldiers, they attacked civilians, burned houses, and destroyed monuments. The city, known for its magnificent temples and statues, saw many of its treasures looted or ruined. This violent event wasn't just about the immediate damage and loss of life, it shook the entire Egyptian civilization, showing that even the greatest and most revered cities could fall to foreign powers. It was a blow to Egyptian pride and a signal that their era of greatness was vulnerable to external threats. Thebes' fall marked a significant downturn for Egypt, indicating a period where power and influence were waning, and it struggled to defend itself against powerful enemies. Next up we have the reign of Akhenaten. Egypt was a land where many gods were worshipped and each had its own temple and priests. 
Then came the pharaoh Akhenaten, who used to be known as Amenhotep IV before he changed his name. He decided that Egypt should worship just one god, the Aten represented by the sun disk. He wanted everyone to focus on this one single god instead of the many gods that they had worshipped for centuries. Akhenaten felt so strongly about this change that he moved the capital to a new city, Akhenaten, now known as Amarna, built to honor a ten. This was a huge deal because it meant leaving behind temples, cities, and traditions that had been a part of Egyptian life for a very long time. But of course, not everyone was happy with this. Many people, especially priests who served other gods, felt lost and angry. They were used to a religion with many gods and didn't want to change. After Akhenaten died, people were so upset with his religious revolution that they moved the capital back and returned to their old gods. They even tried to erase Akhenaten's name from history because they wanted to forget this challenging time. Next up today, we have the collapse of the Old Kingdom. Okay, so think of Egypt as a well organized country where the pharaoh, or like the king, has control over everything, from building pyramids to ensuring the Nile's annual flood irrigates the crops. Suddenly, the central control weakens, and local governors, akin to state governors today, start to assert their independence. They no longer send their wealth to the pharaoh or follow his commands, leading to a kind of every region for itself sort of situation. Now, with the central government weakened, problems start piling up. The Nile, which Egyptians depended on for irrigation, doesn't flood as predictably as before, causing crop failures and famine. People are hungry, and there's less trade because local rulers are more focused on their own regions rather than the whole economy. As the situation worsens, people are less able to focus on grand projects like pyramids or temples. Builders, artists, and workers who would normally be employed in these projects are struggling to survive. Instead of a country known for its impressive monuments, you now see smaller, less coordinated construction efforts, if any at all. With all these issues, political disunity, economic hardship, and social unrest, Egypt becomes a patchwork of independent states rather than one unified empire. There's more conflict and people are likely very uncertain about the future. It's a tough time and very far from the glory days of pyramid building and powerful pharaohs. This period marks a very significant transition in Egyptian history, demonstrating how a great civilization can face periods of hardship and turmoil. But it's also a testament to the resilience of the Egyptian people that they eventually emerged from this dark age, leading to reunification unification and renewal of their civilization in what is now known as the Middle Kingdom. Moving on down, we have the turmoil seen in the Late Period. During the Late Period of Ancient Egypt, which lasted from about 664 to 332 BC, the country faced many challenges and changes that weakened its power. During this time, powerful empires from neighboring regions kept invading Egypt. First, it was the Assyrians, who were known for their mighty army and military military strategies. They invaded Egypt in the 7th century BC, taking control of parts of the country. After the Assyrians, the Persians came in and established their rule over Egypt not once, but twice. First around 525 BC, and then again in the 4th century BC. These invasions were harsh and often violent, causing a lot of suffering for the Egyptian people. And unfortunately, during this period, Egypt lost a lot of its autonomy, because these foreign empires were making the decisions and controlling the land. This was such a significant change from earlier times when Egypt was a powerful and independent civilization. With each invasion, the conquerors brought their own ways of life, beliefs, and governance structures, which significantly influenced Egyptian culture and politics. While some aspects of Egyptian culture remained, many others were altered or replaced, leading to a blend of traditions, but also some loss of the country's unique heritage. The Invading forces often used violence to assert their control over Egypt, overpowering the local rulers and imposing their authority. This not only caused immediate harm and disruption, but also left long-lasting impacts on the country's stability and development. Next up today, we have the Battle of Kadesh. Fought around 1274 BC between
between the Egyptians, led by Pharaoh Ramesses II, and the Hittites was one of the biggest chariot battles ever recorded. Even though Ramesses II claimed it was a huge victory, historians now believe it was a bit more of a draw, with neither side winning decisively. Imagine two of the biggest teams of soldiers and chariots from ancient times clashing in a massive battle. These were the Egyptians and the Hittites. Both sides fought fiercely, causing a lot of damage and loss. The battlefield would have been chaotic with thousands of soldiers and horses engaged in combat. Despite what Ramesses II later said, he really liked to boast that he won, both sides were pretty beaten up and couldn't claim a real victory. The really important outcome was that after this battle, the Egyptians and the Hittites decided to stop fighting and made a peace treaty. It's actually one of the earliest peace treaty agreements in history we know about and shows that even after such a big fight, the two sides saw the value in stopping the conflict and agreeing to live peacefully. Next up, we have the persecution of pagans. In the early centuries AD, Egypt was part of the Roman Empire and experienced a significant shift in religious practices. Over time, Christianity began to spread across the empire, reaching Egypt and growing in influence. As Christianity grew more prominent, tensions arose between the new Christian communities and the traditional pagan or polytheistic religions that had been practiced in Egypt for millennia. These religions included worship of ancient Egyptian deities as well as Greco-Roman gods. The Serapium was a grand temple in Alexandria dedicated to the god Serapis, who was a blend of Egyptian and Greek godly aspects. This temple was not just a religious center, but also a symbol of the cultural and religious identity of many Egyptians who were still adherent to the old pagan faiths. By the late antique period, around the 4th century AD, the Christian authorities and populace in Alexandria grew increasingly hostile towards pagan symbols, which they saw as idolatrous and contrary to Christian teachings. This culminated in the violent destruction of the Serapium, an event that historians view as emblematic of the wider suppression of pagan religions by increasingly dominant Christian forces. The demolition of the Serapium was a significant moment, symbolizing the decline of ancient Egyptian pagan and the transition towards a predominantly Christian culture in Egypt. It marked not just the physical end of a major religious and cultural institution, but also represented a broader shift in Egyptian society, where ancient religious practices were progressively marginalized and suppressed. And next up we have the execration texts. Think of the execration texts as ancient Egypt's version of a curse or a hex. These were not ordinary writings, but serious rituals aimed at protecting Egypt from its enemies. The execration texts were inscriptions found on pottery fragments or figures made from clay or wax. And these weren't just random curses, they were specific, targeting people or places that posed a threat to Egypt. The names inscribed on these objects were often those of enemy leaders, rival nations, or even even rebellious groups within Egypt itself. By naming their foes, the Egyptians believed they could exert control or bring misfortune upon them. After the names were inscribed, the objects were ritually destroyed, typically broken, crushed, or sometimes even burned. This act was symbolic, representing the destruction or weakening of Egypt's enemies. This practice just goes to show how seriously the ancient Egyptians took their spiritual beliefs and rituals. They believed that words, especially when used in a ritual context, had real power. By performing these curses, they thought they could influence the world around them, protect their country, and maintain order in the universe. And finally, finishing off our list today, we have the Famine Stella. This is an ancient stone tablet that tells a story from a time around 4,600 years ago during Pharaoh Djoser's rule. It was found on Sahel Island, which is in the Nile River near a city called Aswan in southern Egypt. The story on this stone talks about a very tough time in Egypt where there was no rain for seven years. Because there was so little rain, crops didn't grow very well and people did not have enough 
enough food to eat. Pharaoh Djoser, who was like the king of Egypt, was really worried about his people. He wanted to help them, so he prayed to a god named Kunum. Kunum was believed to control the Nile River's flooding, which was crucial for watering crops. The Stella says that Djoser asked Kunum to make the Nile flood again so that the fields could be watered, crops could grow, and people could eat and just be happy again. According to the story, Kunum listened to Djoser's prayers, and the Nile began to flood properly again, which then ended the famine. While the exact historical accuracy of the seven year famine is debated, the story captures the essence of how ancient Egyptians understood and responded to such dire challenges. All right, guys, that has been our list for today. Thanks so much for checking it out. I've been your host today, Olivia Kozlowski, and I'll see you all again very soon, I'm sure. Bye.